was here for October Movement Night? Yeah. Awesome, yes. So my man Grayson, um, aside from his ax chopping story where he's like this, um, he talked about how to fight the fear, how to fight the fear. Uh, he, he talked about a lot of different fears, but this man, bro, you didn't even mention my fear. So, so growing up, and I wonder if any of you know what this is. Growing up, I suffered from nyctophobia. Does anybody know what that is? No. It's just honestly, y'all, it's a fancy way of saying I was a little crybaby and I was afraid of the dark. Yeah, who else is afraid of the dark? Thank you. Thank you. So, so y'all, here's the truth. Here's the truth. Anybody that's afraid of the dark isn't actually afraid of the dark. Hold on. You're afraid of what's in the dark. Y'all know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, like the lights are on, life is good. I'm just singing, dancing, frolicking. And then as soon as the lights cut off, the boogeyman pops up out of nowhere. You know, like he's ready to crawl from underneath my bed and get me every time. So growing up, I was so afraid of the dark that, <laughs> don't judge me. Y'all promise not to judge me? Okay. I was so afraid of the dark that <laughs> I would have to sleep in the same bed as my little sister. <laughs> hold on, hold on, that's not, just wait. And I would sleep against the wall just in case a monster would grab us, it would grab her first. <laughs> so true, so, so that just shows you, I grew up so afraid of the dark. And there, there was this time a few years ago, the scariest moment of my entire life, like I, honestly thought I was going to die. I was in Africa. Okay. Africa's great. I love it. But there was this one issue with Africa. Occasionally, the lights would just cut off, like all power. I would just be chilling, eating my bugs, and the lights, <laughs> and the lights would just cut off, and I would freak out. Now, most of the time, I was with other people, like I would be with Aaron or, or Grayson, and I knew that if a monster tried to jump out, we were going to jump this man. Like, like if the boogeyman popped out, I'm going to kick him in his face. Like, I'm black. I know what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> um, but this one time, I, I was taking a shower, okay? And for obvious reasons, I was alone. And, <laughs> and during this shower, I was singing. And, and who else during the shower feels like they should, oh, like, have a record? You know, like, I should have a record label. Like, I'm just... I raise a hallelujah. You know, like all that stuff. Hey, stop it, I can't sing. Um, and I guess, I guess the demons knew that because out of nowhere, the lights cut off in the shower. Y'all, it was this moment where two thoughts came in my mind. One, my life, it just flashed before my eyes. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm in Africa. I ate some bugs. I lived a pretty good life. <laughs> this monster can have me. But then I thought, I'm in the shower, and whoever would find my body would see everything. <laughs> so I said, not a good plan. So I said, all right, scratch that plan. Second plan, I'm going to make a run for it. I'm going to make a run for this. I was like, you know what, I play football, I'm pretty fast. So I rip open the curtain, I run, I grab a towel or something. I'm not sure what it was. And I halfway covered up, but I didn't really care. I just tried to. And I remember running out of the door, looking for anybody and anything to save me. And out of nowhere, my friend Brandon ran in with the flashlight and he was like, you, you okay, Aaron? And I was like, oh my goodness, like, Yes, now I'm okay. I don't care that I'm exposed to you and you see everything. I don't care that I'm, I'm soaking wet. I just care because you came and saved me. And here's what I realized. That that wasn't just the moment that I got scared in Africa. I realized that that was more of a picture of my life overall. That there was a point or a season in my life where everything seemed to be going good. The lights were on, I was singing, I was filled with joy, but out of nowhere, it seemed as if the lights cut off. And I would be running in darkness, looking for anybody or anything to save me. There was a moment when, when I was surrounded by depression and anxiety and, and insecurities 
And I was just running through life from third grade to a junior in high school looking for the only thing or anything that could save me. And I just wonder, y'all, if there's some of y'all in here today that share that same story. Where life was great and then something happened and then all of a sudden you were running through life looking for anything and anybody to save you. So what we want to do tonight is help direct you and help you discover the only thing, the only person that can save you. The only thing and the only person that can help you get out of this darkness. So the only thing I know about darkness or anything that's broken is if you want to fix what's broken or if you want to turn the lights back on, you need to figure out why it's broken in the first place. So like how many of y'all ever been to the doctor? Great, yeah. I, growing up, I would go to the doctor all the time, and um, I remember I would have a cough, I would have a fever, and I would go into the doctor, and the doctor would say, what's wrong? And I would look at the doctor, and I would say, I have a cough, I'm not feeling too good, I can't talk. And the doctor would look at me, and he'd be like, that's not your problem. Your problem is that you have strep throat. The coughing, the sore throat, these are all symptoms pointing to a greater problem. And I want to challenge y'all today and tell you that your depression, your anxiety, the, the insecurities you're facing in life, you searching around looking for a good feeling, that is not the problem you're dealing with. There is a deeper virus attacking your heart and your mind. Those are just symptoms. So real quick, what we're going to do, I'm going to point out the problem. Grayson, he's going to point to the answer. And then Aaron, she's going to say, will you accept it? Sound good? Great. So I found that the virus that we all suffer from is actually found in Romans 3. In Romans 3, it says this, 3 verse 9. It says that all Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. In other words, it's saying no matter who you are or what you look like, you all are, I am, Grayson is, Aaron is, we're all under the power of this thing called sin. In other words, we are all attacked by the same virus called sin. Romans 3.23 says, for everyone has sinned. I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this word sin, it, it honestly just means that we chose our way over God's way. What sin looks like in my life is that one time I cheated on a test. Sin looks like taking it too far with a boyfriend or girlfriend. Yeah, we're going to get serious tonight. Sin looks like staying up late, watching something on my phone, looking at something I shouldn't look at because I need to go to sleep. Sin looks like dishonoring my parents when God says to honor your father and your mother. Sin, sin looks like thinking self-harm thoughts. Sin looks a lot of different ways. And I know some of you today might be thinking to yourself, hey, what's so wrong with that? Like, Aaron, really, what's wrong with, with cheating on a test? What's wrong with lying? What's wrong with taking things too far? What's wrong with going to a party? I'm just trying to have a little fun. Well, the Bible says this in Romans 6, 23. It says, for the wages or the payment for your sin, for your lie, for you taking it too far, the, the payment for that is death. So you ask me if it makes you bad, and I'll tell you no. It makes you dead. Sin is the reason why one of my close friends who just had a baby passed away from a drug overdose. Sin is the reason why my baby cousins no longer have parents. Sin is the reason why my family got torn apart because someone we trusted dearly took advantage of my family, of, of my little sister. Sin doesn't make you bad, it kills you. And here's the thing that I know about dead people is that they can't move. So if that's the case, then, then if you and I sinned, there's nothing we can do about it to get ourselves out of the mess we've got ourselves into. Because we're dead, we can't move. Dead people can't try to come back to life. It takes someone else or something else to bring them back to life. The wages for your sin, the wages for my sin, it kills us. But there's a good part of that, about that verse, and I don't want to just keep y'all sad. That, that verse, it actually says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. 
So real quick, Grayson, we, we just explained to us like what that gift looks like, who can get it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that, that eternal, I, I can't sit, y'all. I got to stand up. I can't sit. Because tonight the message is never, it's never going to be about self-help. It's, we don't have six steps in a poem for you to get your life right. There's only one answer tonight. There's only one way that your life changes, and it's through the person of Jesus Christ. Come on. I just, yeah. I just want to reiterate what Aaron just said. He said, sin doesn't make you bad. It makes you dead. The only way you're getting out of that is through the person who defeated it. This is the message of Jesus Christ that, that we messed up, that we sinned, that we went our own way. And he came from heaven to earth just for you. Yeah, you. You have a plan. You have a purpose. You have a calling. He came for you. And he died on the cross. And he didn't stay dead on the third day. He resurrected and now he's living. Just for you. And so tonight, I've walked into many rooms like this. And I've heard a message just like this. And I've and I felt shame. I felt guilt. And I've walked away going, I'm bad. And tonight, our hope is not that you would walk out going, I'm bad. But that you would walk out going, this is how good God is. That even in my sin, even when I messed up, that he pulled me out. <laughs> that he drew me close. And I'm, we're not going to stand for it. You're not going to walk out of here feeling bad. No, you're going to walk out of here going, man, the living God came for me. <laughs> he came for me, a high, school, a high school kid from Alabama came for me because he saw something in me. And tonight, you may have no one in your life that sees potential in you, but I'm telling you, there's a living God who created all of this, the heavens, the earth, the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end. He believes in you, and he, <laughs> he sees potential in you. There's a famous theologian, his name is A.W. Tozer, and theologian is just a fancy word for a guy who's smart and reads the Bible a lot. That's, that's what theologian means, if you ever wondered. And so this theologian, he says this, he says, what you think when you think of God is the most important thing about you. What you think when you think of God is the most important thing about you. And then later he says, we move towards our mental image of who God is. And so tonight, some of you have walked in here and you have, you have a picture of God. You have a view of God. Some of you walked in and you think God's an angry God. And that every time you make a bad choice, that he's just up there frowning, he's mad at you, he's upset with you, you're never gonna be enough, you're never gonna, you're never gonna beat the sin that's in your life, you're never gonna um, get out of this cycle, and he's mad at you. Some of you have a view of God like he's the Christian scorecard keeper. That when I'm doing good, I'm close to him. When I'm at tribe, when I come to movement night, when I'm in church, when I'm serving on the dream team, that, that I'm close to him. But the moment, the moment that I watch something I'm not supposed to, I've done it. That's when I feel like God's separated from me and he's disappointed and he doesn't want anything to do with me. And now every time I come to church, I just feel shame and like, if I raise my hand, who do you think you are? You're a hypocrite. I felt that. Not tonight. Not tonight. There's this story in the Bible called the prodigal son. And prodigal, many, many people think it means wayward. It doesn't. It means, it means lavish. And so the, the story of the prodigal son, it goes like this, that there were two sons. And that each son had an inheritance. And the younger son, he comes up to his father and he goes, hey, I want my inheritance now, just if to put it in our terms, millions of dollars. He just, hey, I want it now. The father gives him the, the money. And this is what he does. He said, the Bible says a couple of days later, he flees. And he goes his own way. And I like to call this a freedom fail. Like, 
God gives us free will. He's not, he's not a puppet on a string like trying to tell you to what, like, no. He, he says, hey, you get to choose me or yourself. And so the son, he chose himself and he, he ran away and he rebelled against God. And he ran out, he did all his things. I mean, he partied, hung out with all the celebrities. I mean, this dude had the Lamborghinis. I mean, the fear of God is all he wore. Like, he, he, I mean, he, he lived it up. But it says that there was a light switch moment where everything went downhill. When his plan, the plan that he had for himself, it just didn't line up with what he thought. Like the expectation didn't line up with the reality. And it says this, he says, he sold himself to slavery. And I wonder what you're selling yourself to tonight. I wonder, I wonder tonight if you sold yourself to Instagram. I wonder tonight if you sold yourself to popularity. I, I wonder what you, it, he went his own way and then it, then it says this in the Bible that it got so bad, he went bankrupt, he lost everything he had and he said he was even begging to eat from the pig's trough. It got so bad. And maybe you feel like tonight that you've went your own way, that you've chose, chosen yourself, and that you're at the bottom of the barrel, wanting to give up. But here's the best part of the story. In his head, he said, if I can just go back to my father's house, maybe I can just be a servant. And some of you are thinking you're going to work your way back to God. That's just not how it works. Ethan mentioned earlier, this is not re religion. It, we don't just work our way back to God. But he plays it out, and it says he comes, to the, he comes to the farm. And I just picture it. Like, if you just see it, it's a big farmland. I mean, all kinds of animals, the cows, the goats. I mean, everything. Two white fences, a house that sits in the yonder, what we say in Alabama. <laughs> it's just sitting out there. And he walks, up to the, he walks up to the piece of property, and he looks at his father. And it says in the, oh, it says, his father seen him at a distance, which means, I want you to catch this, the father never turned, never turned his back on him. He didn't turn his back on you. He wasn't just working. He wasn't distracted by anything. No, he was focused. He was waiting for his son to come back, and he's waiting on you tonight. And here's the best part. That's not even the best part. Can't talk. This is it. Sorry, I'm passionate about this. I want you to get this. It says, the father ran to the son. Why is that so important? Because you don't have a God that's just waiting for you to come to him. No, you have a God that's seen you from a distance. And he said, oh, my son's home. I'm going to run with him with open arms. I'm coming to get him. My son's home. He's healed. He once was lost. He's now found. I'm coming to get him. And tonight, come on, God is running after you. You have the eternal God, the one who created the heavens and the earth. He is running after you tonight. He is pursuing you. In your failure, in your bad decision, he still wants you. And he doesn't even do it out of obligation. He wants you. And I know every single person in this room wants to feel wanted. Wow. Why, why would I feel bad when people don't want me? when the living God wants me. You know what I'm saying? And so the father comes up, he embraces him, takes him in his arms. And remember that conversation he played, if only I can just be a servant in my father's house. And he actually says it to his father. He said, hey, hey, dad, I'll just be a servant in your house. Like I'll, I'll just tend the fields, I'll watch the animals. Like that's what I'll do. I know I, know I sinned against you, I know I went my own way. That's what I'll do. And I just, in this, in this story, I just, I just see his, the father just kind of like look back at him like, like you think I'm going to let you come back here and be a servant? You're my son. 
you're my daughter. You don't think I'm big enough for the sin in your life? <laughs> and he tells his servant, he said, hey, I want you to go get the fattened calf, the, the prime rib. I, I want you to go get the Yeezys. I want you to go get the Louis Vuitton jacket. I want you to get the best. And I want you to put it on my son because my son who once was dead, who once was lost, who once lived in his own way, he's now found. He's home. He's here. We're going to party. Heaven's going to party. <laughs> and tonight there's going to be a party because there's a lot of you that's lost. But after tonight, you're going to be found. And you're not going to have a mad God sitting up there about time you're here. No. You're going to have a father who loves you so much, you died on a cross for your sins, who says, hey, I'm so glad you're home. I'm so glad you're home. Come on, can we give God praise for just a second? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, he chose you. And so I have one question for you. If in your sin, if in your bad decision, God lovingly pulled you close and he chose you. If, if that was his response to your sin, my question to you is what's your, what's your response back to him? Yeah. Aaron, can you help us out with that? So now is the moment where it's, it's your turn. It's your turn for a response. Now is the moment and tonight is your night. And I know all across the auditorium right now, I can, I can remember six and a half years ago when I was this person sitting in the room, I remember walking in and I hear a message just like this. And I experience all that we've experienced tonight. And I remember sitting here and thinking, I walked in, it wasn't just that night, but rather it was night after night and week after week and month after month of thinking that it culminated into this one night. But there's got to be more to life than this. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've come in tonight and that's the resounding thought in your, in your mind. Is there's got to be more to, more to life than just living eight to three when I get out of school and then what? There's got to be more to life than just Friday coming, the weekend's here, and then I go party and then I repeat waiting for the next weekend. I know, I know what you're feeling and maybe all across the, the whole night tonight, you have felt something going on inside of you. Maybe your heart's been beating out of your chest. Maybe you're experiencing all these things. And I know that because that was, that was me. Six and a half years ago, sitting right here in a moment just like this. And maybe up until this point in your life, you've done like me. Maybe you've searched and you've searched and you've searched for what your soul's missing. You've looked for this, this thing or this something or this person to feel the void in your heart. Maybe you look for, you've got this idea of, man, this, my world is falling apart all around me and I just want peace. So I'm gonna try that drug. I'm gonna try getting drunk just for a moment of reprieve. And maybe, maybe you're just so desperate for hope. You're so desperate for approval. You're so desperate just to be accepted and loved. So you're willing to do anything, anything. You're willing to do anything just for that laugh, just for that acceptance, just for some bit of popularity. And what we're here to tell you tonight is those things were never meant to satisfy you. They weren't made for that. In fact, you're here tonight because we've told you and we know it from our own story is that Jesus is the answer. The hope you're desperate for is in Jesus. The grace you need is in Jesus. We've been broken tonight, thinking about you, young man, young woman. You're desperate, and you're searching, and you're doing all these things. You're trying drugs, you're trying alcohol, you're trying relationships. If, this, if I would just do this for this boy, if I would just do this for this girl, maybe they would approve of me. Maybe they would love me. And we're broken because that was us. And some of you, that's you. That's you. But we're here to tell you that there's hope. 
Remember when I walked in and said, oh, there's got to be more to life six and a half years ago? I found the answer. We found the answer. The answer is Jesus. Like I said, the future you're desperate to have, the purpose, the potential, the satisfaction and fulfillment, it's all wrapped in Jesus. The approval you want is in Jesus. The acceptance you want is in Jesus. It's all found in Jesus. And we're so desperate for you to get that tonight, especially on the eve of a young person just like you, broken and desperate and hurting. And so they took hands, matters in their own hands. But tonight, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. Tonight, there can be hope. Tonight, there's a future. And so now is your moment. Now is your moment to say, I'm drawing a line in the sand. No more turning back. Tonight is my night. And now is my moment to give my life to Jesus. No more with the world. All in with Jesus. Tonight, I'm saying, God, you're the Lord of my life. You're the Lord of my life, and tonight I want a relationship with you. So now's your moment. All across the room, I want every eye open and every head lifted. We're gonna give, give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. But I want you to be bold. I want you to be bold in this moment because you, if you can't do it in here, you won't be able to do it out there. Because right now, you know what? You're surrounded by people who love you. You're surrounded by people who will encourage you, who will support you, and who right now in this moment are praying that you would make this decision. We're for you. So if that's you, if you know that tonight's your night to begin a relationship with Jesus and to begin and to make him the Lord of your life, I'm gonna give you to the count of three to shoot your hand up. And I didn't, I, this is brought to my attention right now because I, I forgot to say this earlier, but I wanna address it because this was also part of my story was that I also attended church. I kept attending church and I, I could act like a Christian and I could even talk like a Christian talks. And I know there's some of you in the room who maybe, and this is Aaron's story, where we, where we sit in these environments and we can play the part, but you know deep down in your soul, you're not living for Jesus. And so tonight's your opportunity too. So on the count of three, if that's you and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life and begin a relationship with him, I want you to shoot your hand up. One, two, three. Hand up. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up, guys. God bless you. You're a woman of God. You're a man of God. There's a plan and a purpose for you. There's a future for you, young man.